Okay. Welcome to session number 23. I think last time I was out of sequence by one. Last time was 22. That would make this session number 23 of Biblical Backgrounds. Uh, I'm Dr. John McMath, and I'm joined here today by my friends in uh, Italy and in the Philippines uh, and in various parts of uh, the U.S. Uh, good to see everybody. Uh, we're looking at uh, the uh, backgrounds of uh, the New Testament, and today in particular, uh, we're going to get into the archaeological background of Paul. Uh, today, I think we're, we're only going to get as far as uh, Syria and Asia Minor, uh, but I want to show you some of the uh, the background stuff. Uh, I've got uh, several pictures today from places that I actually haven't been, uh, and, uh, and I have to uh, use uh, use pictures that I've collected from other sources. Uh, but they're all it's all good. Uh, there's some places I've been like Ephesus and Smyrna and Istanbul. Some, I've been around Turkey a little bit, but haven't ever gotten very far into the east and have never been able to go to Syria. I would love to go to Syria and Lebanon, uh, but uh, generally speaking, that's not advisable for uh, U.S. citizens right now. Okay, let's uh, let's share the. Uh, uh, the slide, and we will get underway. Let's see if I can make it happen. Okay, watching and watching. There it is. Uh, this photograph is actually in Corinth, uh, in uh, in Greece. Uh, it gives a good background for talking about Paul. Uh, Paul is one of the major characters of the New Testament. Uh, when we were going through uh, the intro to uh, the New Testament, we spent an awful lot of time with uh, Paul's letters. In the book of Acts, uh, it's arguable that Paul is the major character. It's uh, very likely that Luke wrote the book of Acts in order to give details about the ministry of Paul. Uh, one of the uh, interesting problems with doing history of anything, anywhere, anytime, is establishing a chronology. Uh, when did things happen? When did people live? Uh, if there were interactions between people or events, uh, when did it happen? Uh, and sometimes it, it, it works out to be a purely academic uh, question. Other times it actually uh, gets uh, kind of interesting. Uh, for example, if, uh, 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 if uh, Festus was a procurator in Judea in 59 AD, then that puts Paul's imprisonment in Rome at about 60 AD, 60 or 61 AD which is really late because we think that he probably died in Rome about 64. So it doesn't leave him very much time to get to Spain. Uh, and the tradition that he made it as far as London uh, to plant St. Paul's Cathedral uh, just doesn't work at all. Uh, so it, it does matter, some of these things. The archeology span of, uh, of Paul is particularly difficult uh, because of the fact that the, um, the letters of Paul make uh, virtually no reference to uh, the book of Acts. The book of Acts makes no reference at all to the letters that Paul wrote. Uh, it, it, we, we have to infer things and read between lines uh, to uh, the book of Acts pre presents us with a sequence of events, but we wonder where the letters fall into the sequence. We think probably Galatians was the first letter to be written uh, very, very early, maybe uh, 48 or 49 AD, uh, immediately after Paul's first 
missionary journey. Um, and some of the others are, are a little hard to a little hard to figure out, uh, but it's like putting together a puzzle where half of the pieces are missing. Uh, very interesting. So there are a lot of questions about the relationship of the various letters, and they remain open. Uh, uh, scholars disagree, uh, partly because that's what scholars get paid to do, but still scholars disagree about these things. Uh, and uh, archaeology has proven useful. Uh, let's start off with uh, uh, is something that has to do with Corinth. In Acts 18.2, we're told that when Paul arrived in Corinth the first time, he found Priscilla and Aquila there. And they had recently been banished from Rome in a general expulsion of Jews under an emperor named Claudius. Okay, that's so the Bible tells us that. Uh, and we know from the secular historians that Claudius reigned from 41 to 54 AD. So there we have it. Has to be sometime in there, but of course we already knew that. The historian, the uh, Latin Roman historian, refers to the expulsion of the Jews from the city of Rome and puts a date on it of 49 AD. So Paul, at the beginning of his second journey, uh, or here in his second journey, had to have arrived in Rome in, or in uh, Corinth in 49 AD. Uh, we know that Paul stayed in Corinth for 18 months, according to Acts 18.11, at which point he was brought before uh, a governor or the proconsul of uh, Achaia uh, named uh, Gallio. Uh, and at Delphi, also in Greece, just up the, uh, uh, up the Gulf of Corinth, uh, a ways like, or oh, maybe 40 kilometers away, we find Delphi. And at Delphi, there was found an inscription mentioning both Claudius, the emperor, and Gallio. And the inscription had to have been laid down in 52 AD. And we know that Gallio assumed office in the summer of 51. That would put Paul's arrival in Corinth either late in 49 or early in 50 AD. That's a really important uh, uh, number. That number all by itself gives us a, uh, a fixed point in the chronology of Paul, and it affects everything else we do. Now, I've got to be totally honest. Uh, I tend not to pay very good attention to the chronology when I'm when I'm studying, uh, but it's um, it's significant that it can be done. Uh, the the chronology actually works out. Uh, it's <laughs> so yeah, so. Paul arrived around late forty nine, early fifty. Uh, then we've also got. Uh, the, the chronology of uh, Festus. Uh, this is a, yet another uh, governor uh, whom uh, Paul appeared before. And it's been uh, conventional to, to assign an accession date for Festus as procurator of Judea in 59 AD. But we found a coin uh, by uh, a scholar by the name of Vandeman uh, that gives us evidence for an accession date for Festus of 56 AD, which agrees with an ancient historian named Eusebius. Eusebius is a remarkably important character. Uh, his church history that covers the first 300 years of the church uh, is one of our most important ancient sources. Uh, he's a, an absolutely remarkable character. Uh, and he isn't always right about things, but on uh, dates and places, uh, he has been right on. And we've been able to, uh, to correlate so much with his work. So if, uh, if Paul was judged by Festus in Caesarea in 56 AD, 
uh, then that simplifies Paul's dates. And that shortens the timeline between Gallio and Festus and puts Paul in prison in about 57 AD. And that leaves time for Spain. Uh, and maybe even time to make it up to London. It depends on how the ferry boats were working, <laughs> but whatever. Uh, so the chronology is kind of the, the set of hooks that we use to line up the events that take place in the Bible. And I'm not going to present a complete chronology here, uh, but uh, uh, the, the point that I'm making is that particularly by New Testament times, uh, we have really good luck uh, laying out an argument for uh, the biblical chronology. Uh, and, and we can assign dates, we can assign places, uh, we can assign names to the characters uh, from the secular history. All right, let's see if I can make the next one come up. Ooh, there it is. So Syria and Asia Minor. Uh, uh, Syria, of course, is the uh, modern area of Syria and Lebanon. Uh, uh, le these, these two states uh, were not really separated in antiquity. Uh, Cyprus, for that matter, is considered in the same light. But anyway, we've got this area of Syria uh, and Asia Minor, where Paul did his first missionary journey. Uh, not, uh, not surprisingly, uh, these territories, Syria and Asia Minor, uh, became the heartland of the church. Uh, the uh, Christians uh, were first called Christians in Syria, in a place called Antioch. Uh, and in Asia Minor, uh, the, uh, uh, the landscape was dotted with, uh, with cities that were visited by the Apostle Paul uh, and uh, a sport uh, magnificent medieval churches. Uh, most of the archaeology that we actually can find today, uh, ruins and, and such, is uh, churches. Uh, now, why does that matter? You think, oh, well, you know, it's the Middle Ages. Sure, there are churches everywhere. Uh, there, there were big churches all over Asia Minor and for that matter, all over Greece, uh, Macedonia in particular. Uh, most of them today are in ruins. Uh, the, uh, the Christian population in the East, uh, in uh, Syria and Egypt, and, uh, Asia Minor, and Macedonia, uh, the Eastern part of the Roman Empire was predominantly Christian, and there was a very large population there. Uh, this is why uh, the, uh, the early church grew rapidly. Uh, it was an urban event. Uh, uh, Paul would go into a place and plant a church, and that church uh, became a center for evangelism and for the training of leaders. Uh, and, uh, so entire cities uh, would be converted to Christianity in, with very large numbers very early. Uh, and uh, this went on well into the Middle Ages. Uh, it stopped uh, or came to a serious obstacle in the seventh century with the Muslim invasions. When the Arabs came out of the desert and proclaimed uh, that Muhammad is the new prophet, uh, and uh, we all have to go along with that or we'll kill you, uh, the uh, Christians all over the East continued to be Christian. Uh, places like Antioch that we'll, we'll speak of in a moment uh, was one of the first cities to be liberated from the Muslims uh, it, during the Crusades. It was a major Christian city uh, by 1000 AD when the Crusades happened. It was still a major Christian city, but it was ruled by Muslims. This was true all over Asia Minor, all over Syria. Uh, in these places, the 
the churches were not immediately destroyed and Christians didn't enthusiastically become Muslims. Christians remained Christian and they continued to teach their children to the extent that they could. As this got more and more difficult over the centuries, the churches weakened, uh, they died out. That was the policy of the Muslim rulers. Uh, but uh, Christianity um, was still strong, very strong uh, in the Mediterranean world, uh, well, well into the Muslim uh, era. Uh, much of what is sometimes called the golden age of Islam was the result of uh, the uh, forced cooperation of very large numbers of Christians who lived in these places. Uh, so a lot of what we find is the ruins of old churches. When we look at them, like this ruin here is in a place called Philadelphia. Uh, magnificent structures. This was, the, uh, this was a basilica church structure. You can see the, the triune front doors, a big door in the middle and smaller doors on either side. Uh, very, very big church. Uh, and why did they need such a huge church? Because everybody in town was Christian. They all came to this place. Uh, and this was a, a place that was the, uh, uh, the teaching center uh, for a very large geographical area around it. Uh, so we'll look at some of these things. Uh, uh, admittedly, a lot of this is uh, secondary, but why was this church so big and so prosperous? So why was it thriving uh, if the Bible, in fact, is not true? That's just interesting. This is Paul's first missionary journey. Uh, a, a common map, and uh, we looked at this map when we studied the, uh, the book of Acts. Uh, Paul's uh, uh, ministry really begins in Damascus. That's at number one on this map. Damascus is an ancient city. I'll show you a picture or two of Damascus here in a minute. Uh, and uh, it was the capital of the Aramean people group. The uh, language that the uh, Jews spoke at the time of Christ was actually Aramaic, the language of Syria. Uh, and after the time of Christ, Aramaic changed its name to Syriac, and it was the major language of the, uh, of the church and of theological writings in the East uh, well into uh, the first millennium, um, up to about the time of the Crusades, uh, the the East was still producing theological work in Syriac, uh, so it's still an important language for us to study today. There's very little left in Damascus from uh, New Testament times. It's an old, old city. Uh, that that city uh, uh, is one of the longest living cities. Uh, anywhere that's still inhabited, uh, at least as old as Jericho uh, or even Jerusalem. There's a cardo that goes right through the middle of the old city, the old part of Damascus, uh, that uh, is called uh, Straight Street. So the Bible talks about the street called Straight. Uh, that would be the Cardo Maximus of the Roman era. And uh, it's probably still in the same place, although there are no features left. Uh, Jerusalem, of course, is a, a place that Paul visited often. Uh, the, uh, the Bible tells us right to where to expect Jerusalem, and lo and behold, there's Jerusalem with all of its features. Uh, we don't need to spend a lot of time with uh, Jerusalem. Uh, Tarsus is at number three on that map, and it's an ancient city. Uh, it uh, controlled the land route into Asia Minor, uh, known as the Cilician Gates. And I'll show you a picture of that in the next, uh, next slide. Uh, but Tarsus is Paul's hometown. This is the place where he studied. Uh, and we know he studied Torah under 
a rabbi named Gamaliel, one of the authors of the Talmud. But he also studied uh, uh, the uh, Stoic philosophers. So he got a well-rounded Greek education uh, in Tarsus, which was a major Roman city at this time. So Paul was a Roman citizen by birth, uh, which often uh, came up in his interactions with Roman authorities along the way. Uh, Antioch is at number four and number nine. Antioch is another major city, and I've got some pictures of Antioch. Uh, it's uh, 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 the place we're told in Acts 9, uh, where uh, the church was first called Christian. The word Christian means Christianos. So it's, a, it's a Greek term, uh, and it could be translated little Christ. So, so these the people in Antioch uh, were so Christ-like in their attitudes and their behavior that the pagans around them accused them of imitating Christ. Uh, offhand, I would say that's probably a good thing to be accused of. Uh, the, uh, the city was one of the first Christian cities to be liberated by the Crusades, 1097 AD, a year-long siege, a uh, terrible, terrible battle. Uh, many deaths on, on both sides until uh, the city was finally liberated. Uh, in uh, about 47 AD, uh, the church at Antioch sent Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. Uh, they went from Antioch to uh, the island of Cyprus, uh, where they had uh, adventures at Salamis and at Paphos, ran into a governor named, governor named Sergius Paulus. Uh, from Cyprus, they sailed on to Asia Minor, went to the mainland, uh, and uh, landed at uh, a place called uh, Italia, the port or Perga, which is the nearby city, and they didn't stop there. Uh, you know, they, they went straight on into central Asia Minor into the region that we call Galatia and the city of Pisidian Antioch, then Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. These are the Galatian churches up around the number seven. From Galatia, they sailed back to Antioch uh, and uh, the report to Antioch, the Jerusalem Council, and that was the first missionary journey. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually possible to put all of these places on the map and uh, to find background for every bit of it. This is uh, the spot that uh, uh, connects Syria and Eastern Turkey. We call this the Cilician Gates. Uh, today, there's a modern highway. In the ancient uh, days, there was a Roman road that came through here. Uh, so this has always been an obvious transportation route. Uh, south of the Cilician Gates in, uh, in Syria uh, is the city of Antioch. And Antioch today is a, a major Syrian uh, city, a fairly important city. But as Christianity spread beyond the borders of Roman Palestine, out into the Jewish diaspora, Antioch was one of its earliest focal points. Uh, Barnabas brought Paul to teach in Antioch in this newly planted, uh, mostly Gentile church. Uh, later on, this church in Antioch was the home base for Paul and Barnabas as they began uh, their missionary career. Uh, Excavations have received, uh, revealed very little of the town from New Testament times. Uh, we know that it was uh, located between the Orontes River and Mount Silpius. Uh, and the, uh, the camera is actually on Mount Silpius and the Orontes River moves in between. So there must have been a city there at some time, but the ruins uh, show us very little.
Uh, the uh, uh, city was laid out in a Greek fashion with a town site roughly uh, one and a half by three kilometers. Uh, the Romans constructed important buildings there, including a, a palace, a circus maximus. They had an aqueduct from the mountains that provided water for the city, a very large theater and an even larger amphitheater provided a locus for gladiators and for various kinds of athletic events. So it was a, it was a big deal. Uh, we know that uh, Antioch was destroyed by an earthquake in 37 AD. Uh, and it was rebuilt under the authority of the emperor Caligula. Now Caligula was one evil dude. He was a very bad man, uh, but even very bad emperors sometimes did the right thing. And in this case, uh, the emperor commanded the rebuilding of the city of Antioch. Uh, and that was for the emperor's own advantage, of course. Antioch is a, a major trading center, very, very important on the trade routes of the world. Uh, so uh, there were temples, there were colonnaded main streets, there were all, all kinds of important stuff was built at that time. And we find just tiny bits of ruins. Uh, the city at the time that Paul was there uh, would have been bustling with the reconstruction. There's a, uh, a relic that has been found in Antioch. Uh, and uh, we call this thing the silver chalice of Antioch. It was uh, actually not discovered until 1910, a little over 100 years ago by an Arab workman who was digging a well of all things. And there it was. And it's a simple cup made out of silver. Uh, there's an inner and an outer cup. The inner cup is just a very simple, unadorned silver cup, but it sits in this magnificent filigree, uh, just a, a very, very fine workmanship uh, uh, with uh, gilded silver gold-plated silver. It's, it's really quite uh, quite the amazing thing. And a close look at the characters on this cup shows Christ and the apostles uh, surrounded by grapevines. Very intricate. Uh, some have suggested, of course, that the reason for the enclosure is that the simple cup, the inner cup, is in fact the very cup of the Last Supper. So this is it. Uh, when, you know, when you ask, what is your quest? Uh, the correct answer is, I, I seek the grail, the cup of Christ. Uh, and uh, there are some who have, of course, shown that or uh, suggested that this has got to be the one. Um, studies have demonstrated that this cup is not a modern forgery. It's actually quite old. Uh, we can't say how old it is. It's most likely medieval, uh, but we can't uh, we can't say that it's uh, uh, it, it, to say that this is the cup of Christ. Uh, there's no way of knowing. Uh, you know, there, there's uh, no there's no evidence that that cup was kept. <laughs> so, uh, is this the right one? Well, probably not. But it's interesting anyway to look at that. Okay, and here's Damascus. Uh, about 130 miles uh, would be about 200 kilometers north of Jerusalem, uh, the other side of the uh, the mountains, other side of Mount Hermon. Uh, it's one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities on the planet. Uh, Paul was converted here. He spent some time uh, preaching there and learning afterwards. Uh, Damascus lies at the meeting place of three roads. Uh, to Mecca, Baghdad, and Egypt. The main international trade route, the Via Maris, goes right through uh, Damascus. So it's obviously an important place. Uh, with, all the, with plenty of water, uh, the uh, Abana River 
flows right along the north side of the city, uh, it comes from Mount Hermon. Uh, lots of water, rich international contacts. Uh, Damascus was something of a paradise on earth in antiquity. Uh, it would have been a fairly nice place to live. Uh, today, most of Damascus looks uh, pretty awful. Uh, yeah, they've, uh, Syria has been in a civil war for many years now. Uh, there's a 50 foot wide colonnaded street, which is a Cardo Maximus, and that's probably a straight street. Uh, there's a gateway uh, in an ancient wall uh, that has been built over by a small Orthodox chapel. So a uh, Syrian Orthodox church that built over the top of this little bit of the wall with a gate in it. Uh, and the tradition is that that's the very gate that Paul escaped from Damascus. Uh, could be, <laughs> maybe it looked like that. Uh, it's uh, actually really hard to know. Okay, let's go up and see a little bit of Tarsus. Uh, Tarsus is located on the southeastern coast of Turkey, a place where the road from Ephesus in western Turkey uh, and the interior, the general area, the central Turkish plateau country where Galatia is located, uh, comes down to the Mediterranean. Uh, the Cilician gates that we saw before have always carried that road. There's a widening of the river at this point that has since dried up. So uh, this particular river is the Euphrates. <laughs> it is a whole different river, but it looks kind of like this. Uh, there was a wide spot in the river which became the ancient harbor. Uh, and uh, Cleopatra, the actual uh, Greek Egyptian queen of Egypt uh, who uh, met with Mark Antony. This was the spot they met at uh, Tarsus. Uh, she uh, 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 brought her sail barge <laughs> up to Tarsus. The importance of Tarsus is the fact that Paul came from here. It was an important city. Uh, it was particularly well known for schools, including many of the most famous of the Stoic philosophers. I'm not showing anything from the city of Tarsus because nothing of significance from the New Testament has been uh, unearthed here. Uh, the New Testament city is probably located about 20 feet uh, below the modern city level. Uh, and um, Turkish archaeologists, being Muslim, are not particularly interested in excavating here. It would be expensive and it would involve uh, buying a lot of modern buildings so as to tear them down and look underneath. It's not likely to ever happen, but I think it would be interesting uh, to do some work in Tarsus. Okay, this is central Turkey as a broad, empty farmland uh, studded with ancient cities. Uh, the modern interior of Turkey is mostly rural. Uh, there are no major cities in central Turkey. Uh, the, uh, the people who live here primarily are dryland farmers. Uh, so the farming for wheat, very big deal. Corn, oats, uh, pasturing for uh, sheep and goats and uh, uh, cows. Uh, it's a uh, it's farmland. Uh, when Paul traveled through the central region of Asia Minor, he encountered the the Anatolian Plateau. This is what we call this very large, high altitude. It's about uh, about seven hundred meters above sea level, uh, and uh, Rome called the area Galatia uh, because they for reasons that I don't understand, believed that it was the home of the Gauls and the Celts. And the Gauls ended up in 
uh, France, and the Celts ended up in uh, Britain and Ireland. Uh, now, how how the Romans made that connection, I honestly don't know, but that was what they thought. They conquered the area in about 66 BC, uh, and they built a system of Roman provinces, uh, and they made the the towns in the Galatian area uh, Roman cities. Uh, for the most part, they didn't. Uh, uh, this wasn't a, a, a huge armed invasion with banners and uh, catapults and swords and whatnot. Uh, the the Romans would come into a place like this in the former Greek territories and uh, make an offer. I say, folks, this is a this is a lovely town you've got here. Uh, uh, we would love uh, uh, to come in and partner with you and uh, build up this town and connect it to with roads uh, all over this area. Uh, it's a win-win situation. And generally speaking, the, uh, the old Hellenistic or Greek uh, cities of Asia Minor uh, just became Roman. Uh, and, uh, uh, Greece became a wholly owned subsidiary of Rome. Uh, uh, Rome, in many important ways, is Greece written large, uh, just a large economy sized Greece. Uh, at any rate, uh, Paul found a rich Hellenistic culture here, a lot of, a lot of Greeks and a lot of well-educated Greeks. Uh, there's a very wide tribal dis, uh, diversity in the region. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about the history of Galatia, but we do know that what the New Testament describes uh, as the uh, civilization of the Galatian region uh, is accurate. About a hundred years ago, a uh, British lawyer by the name of Sir William Ramsey uh, started out as a non-Christian, and he knew that the book of Acts claimed there were lots and lots of towns and uh, important Roman provinces uh, in Asia Minor. So he went to Turkey uh, before World War I uh, and uh, uh, wandered around this place, the 1890s and up to about 1910, uh, excavated in a lot of places and was primarily after inscriptions, but he looked at the ruins and the inscriptions uh, and he found most of the cities that are mentioned in the book of Acts. Uh, he found a surprising number of inscriptions that include characters from the book of Acts. Uh, uh, Ramsey, uh, as he worked, became convinced that the Bible was telling the absolute truth. Uh, if the Bible is true about trivial details, like the administrative uh, positions in Galatian cities and regions, uh, why would the Bible lie about the main points? Uh, and uh, So he, he wrote a book a uh, hundred years ago called St. Paul the Traveler and Roman Citizen. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the story of his conversion uh, and also a, a very careful exposition of the evidence that he found then. Uh, that work has, of course, been supplemented since then. Modern scholars uh, continue to study uh, they continued to travel in this area and uh, uh, look at the, uh, the various bits and pieces. Uh, so we know a lot more now than we did 100 years ago. Uh, but still, most of the cities of uh, Turkey have not been what we would call scientifically excavated. We found a lot. But there is so much more if uh, it were possible to get in. Uh, Antioch of Pisidia, interesting place. It's a different Antioch. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the name Antioch, of course, comes from uh, the 
uh, Roman uh, name Antiochus. Uh, and actually there's more roots in that, but it's a, it's a Roman name named after a Roman uh, emperor. Uh, but Antioch of Pisidia is the uh, western end of the Galatian region. Uh, it's actually just outside of the Galatian province into the Pisidian province. Uh, and we know a little bit about um, uh, Antioch of Pisidia. This is the Cardo, the main street running through the center of town. You can see the, the columns on one side. It's uh, founded on seven hills uh, near a place called Yalvak in Turkey. Uh, Yalvak is uh, uh, another word for no place in particular. Uh, the, 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 it's surprising. Uh, when you go to places like this, uh, that in the ancient world, this was a, a big, prospering, extensive city uh, with hundreds of thousands of people. And uh, today the region supports uh, a few thousand people in a small village. Uh, you have to ask the question, why is that? Uh, the climate has not changed significantly. Uh, it's still farmland and it's still on a major route. Why, why would a place like Antioch suddenly stop functioning? And yet all over uh, Turkey, Syria, and North Africa, uh, we find uh, several thousand cities like Antioch uh, that were once thriving, prosperous Greco-Roman towns, uh, usually with a major Christian presence. Uh, and they've all uh, fallen into ruins. Uh, today, the Muslim inhabitants uh, graze sheep uh, if they do anything at all. And you have to ask yourself, why is that? What what possibly could have gone wrong? Well, what do we know about it? Uh, Ramsey, Sir William Ramsey, worked here from 1880 to 1920, mostly doing inscriptions. Uh, there have been some probes and a few surveys since then, uh, and it uh, shows quite a prosperous Roman city with a great big wall. Uh, the Cardo ran east and west. There was a temple of Augustus, a theater, was built over the Cardo, apparently. Uh, just what we can see from the ruins, the, the theater was built in such a way that the Cardo ran underneath it. Uh, there was kind of a bridge and the, the theater was cantilevered over the top. It was a genuinely unique setup uh, that um, would be difficult to do with reinforced concrete, but the Romans managed to do it. Uh, Ramsey found an inscription uh, in uh, Antioch. Actually, he found several inscriptions that belonged to the children of Sergius Paulus, who was the Roman governor of uh, Cyprus. Uh, 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 Paul and Barnabas stopped on Cyprus. They interacted with Sergius Paulus and uh, led him to the Lord. Uh, he had children, apparently, who lived in Antioch. Uh, this explains why uh, Paul didn't stop at uh, uh, the port city on the coast of Turkey, but went directly inland to Antioch. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Latin inscription here, the first line uh, has uh, 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 Paulus, uh, P-A, looks like a V-L-I-S, uh, Sergius Paulus, uh, could be a U even, it's just a little hard to tell. The uh, line before that is Sergio. So Sergius Paulus, there's his name. Uh, and this, he apparently belonged here. Other inscriptions have been found in uh, Antioch that relate to the same family, the Paulus family. Uh, so, 
Sergius Paulus probably sent a letter with Paul uh, saying, this is my friend Paul. He's told me many important things. Uh, uh, I, I appreciate it if you hear him. Uh, from uh, Antioch of Pisidia, Paul went on to uh, Iconium and Lystra and Derby. Uh, and uh, these three cities have not been excavated. Uh, there uh, are uh, modern Muslim cities built over the top of these areas. Uh, Derby has been surveyed. There's an inscription found uh, 70 years ago that identifies the site as Claudio Derby uh, and uh, its location along a major imperial road makes it likely that this is the, the spot. Uh, scholars, of course, argue about these things, but it doesn't matter. Uh, Perga and Italia and side of Pamphylia are the port cities. Uh, Perga is on the coast and Paul came back down same way he had gone up. This was a major uh, city. The remains at the 150 acre site are impressive. Uh, most of them date to the late Roman period and the Byzantine era. So that, that dates well up in, into the time of the Muslim conquest. Uh, there's a theater here, you can see it in the photo on the right, that would have seated 14,000 people. There was a very large Roman market. Uh, there were fountains, there were city walls, there were towers. Uh, the, uh, the harbor area here is called Italia. Now, Paul left the region through that uh, harbor and probably that's the way he came in. Nearby is uh, uh, the city of Side, which is also mentioned. Uh, Strabo, the historian, mentions that uh, the Side, uh, uh, before the time of Paul, was a center for slave trade. Uh, it was a, uh, a major center uh, of slave trade that was actually stopped uh, by the Emperor Pompey uh, before the time of Paul. Uh, so this was a, a thoroughgoing, truly evil pagan city. And there was no synagogue anywhere in this area. So this is why Paul didn't, didn't stop. Uh, if we continue to the West, uh, as long as we're in Asia Minor, I'm going to take us over to Ephesus briefly. I've already shown you some Ephesus slides, so I'll just show you a few more. Uh, we'll look at the, uh, the seven cities of Asia Minor, uh, seven cities of, uh, 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 of the book of Revelation. So this one is Ephesus. Uh, and, uh, this particular uh, temple is a temple of something or other. I think this is a temple of Aphrodite uh, at, uh, at Ephesus. But Ephesus was a major Greco-Roman city and continued to be a very, very important place uh, well into the Middle Ages. Its harbor finally silted up in the eighth century uh, and it had to be abandoned. Uh, this is, I, I call this guy uh, gladly the cross-eyed bear. Um, <laughs> I, I love the carvings that we find in these old Roman cities. The cities that John wrote to in the book of Revelation uh, are located along the coast and the river valleys of Western Asia Minor, uh, Western Turkey today. Uh, roads ran up the coast from Ephesus to Smyrna and Pergamum, and from there a road inland through the valleys to Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Uh, and it's not an accident that the letters of Revelation 1 through 3, the seven churches, are arranged in this sequence. The cities must, in ancient times, have been on a sort of semicircular postal road. Uh, the uh, city of Ephesus was the most important of the circle, and it was the mother church of this whole region. Our oldest and best manuscripts of the letter of Ephesus lacks the note in Ephesus in verse one. So many scholars believe that Paul wrote that first letter 
as an encyclical. It was designed to be sent to all of the churches. Uh, and later on, he added, he, he wrote another copy of it directly to the church in Ephesus. Uh, in general, most of the churches mentioned in uh, the Revelation passage have not been excavated. Uh, those that have been excavated have uh, yielded very little related to the New Testament period. Most of what we find is from the, uh, the broader Roman culture. Uh, and from the church age, uh, but massive churches often. Okay, so here's Western Turkey. And if we start looking at this on the map, there's Ephesus, uh, there's Smyrna, modern Izmir, major port city. Pergamum is farther up the coast, Thyatira, is inboard from Pergamon. Uh, there are uh, Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. Uh, near Laodicea, we also find Colossae and Hierapolis. Off the coast of Turkey, just beyond the island of, Sam of uh, Samos is found the little island of Patmos, which is where John was uh, uh, exiled. Uh, and the Roman postal road looks something like this. And I, I could be wrong about just about everything, but that postal road is still there. Uh, it's uh, actually surprisingly easy to find the old Roman roads. Often, uh, I would say more often than not, uh, the modern uh, paved roads that the buses run on are the old Roman roads. They follow the same course because it always makes a certain amount of sense. Okay, let's look at some of the ruins. This is some ruins from Thyatira. I haven't been there. Uh, it was excavated about 50 years ago. There's a, uh, a stoa or... Uh, uh, commercial area uh, and uh, some other Roman ruins that are visible. Uh, Thyatira was known as a prosperous place with uh, textile. The production of red purple dye from the Mediterranean murex shell was centered here. That purple uh, dye was a very, very important uh, economic uh, thing. Only royalty could buy the purple. Uh, Paul's first convert uh, in Europe was Lydia in, uh, 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 in uh, 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 Macedonia, uh, who is a seller of purple from Thyatira. Uh, and uh, Paul met Lydia at Philippi, uh, where the only synagogue was out next to a next to a river outside of town. So Lydia was probably a very wealthy woman. And uh, that's, that's what little we know about Thyatira. We're sure of the location of the place, uh, but there's very little to show. Uh, the city of Philadelphia remains unexcavated. It lies under a modern Turkish town. Uh, Strabo tells us that Philadelphia was a victim to numerous earthquakes. Uh, and there are still earthquakes today. Uh, so most modern inhabitants don't live in town. They stay out in their villages. Uh, and there are very few tall buildings left in Philadelphia. Uh, the ruins that we see in Philadelphia are, are the ruins of a genuinely massive old cathedral, a gigantic thing. Uh, this fell down in the uh, 8th century. Uh, after the uh, the Muslim invasion uh, and was never rebuilt, of course. Uh, uh, throughout the all of the Muslim dominated lands, uh, when churches fall down, uh, they cannot be rebuilt. Uh, generally speaking, under the jizya rules, uh, Christians were allowed to meet together as long as they kept quiet and didn't ring bells. They were not allowed to repair their churches. If a church had been built, 
uh, the Muslims allowed it to remain standing. They rarely tore them down, uh, except when they wanted the materials for their mosques. Uh, but they, Christians continued to stay there until the buildings fell down of uh, neglect, after which they couldn't be rebuilt. Uh, this was one of the ways that Christians were discouraged from being Christian. But you can see the, the substantial amount of uh, construction that happened there. Uh, this is the area of Laodicea. It's on the Meander Valley. Uh, lots of earthquakes here. We know it was destroyed around uh, 60 BC, again in 19 AD. Uh, it uh, received help in rebuilding from the Roman emperors. Uh, there was a, a catastrophic uh, quake in 60 AD uh, that uh, was rebuilt without Roman help. And there's kind of a self-sufficient attitude. Revelation 3 says, uh, I know about you guys. You say, I am rich and have prospered. I need nothing. <laughs> so Laodicea had a kind of a pride street. Uh, there hasn't been much excavation here. We see some Greek and Roman city ruins, uh, including a theater, an amphitheater, other things. So we know the place is right. Uh, there's an inscription here uh, uh, in Laodicea by a freed slave from Laodicea. Uh, and it was dedicated to one Marcus Cestius Philemon, which is very interesting. It will be re recalled that there's a Philemon in the New Testament. <laughs> Philemon was the owner of a slave named Onesimus who ran away and came to Paul. Paul sent him back with the letter of, to Philemon. Uh, and uh, this Philemon was a leader in the church at Colossae which is just up the river from Laodicea. Uh, and so it's a, it's a coincidence of names uh, that really ought to be something we could figure out. Um, it's intriguing uh, to, uh, to find the, these names and the, uh, and the freed slave all put together in the same inscription, uh, but we can't say for sure. Uh, if we keep going, we're going to find Hierapolis and Colossae. Uh, and again, there's not much to see here. Uh, Christianity was probably brought to the Meander Valley. Uh, uh, cities of uh, Laodicea, Hierapolis, and uh, Colossae by Epaphras, who was uh, one of Paul's uh, co-workers, mentioned in Colossians 1 and in Philemon 23. There's an inscription uh, from one uh, T. Asinius Epaphroditus uh, found at Colossae. And Epaphroditus and Epaphras are the same name. Uh, so it could be the same guy. Again, this is intriguing. We have no way of following up. Uh, Hierapolis contains a variety of uh, Roman era ruins. None can be dated to the New Testament. Uh, it was destroyed along with other cities in the region uh, fairly early, uh, about 17 and then 60 AD, and then was rebuilt and then eventually fell down during the Muslim uh, period. The surrounding area has hot springs, sulfur springs. Uh, this place is called uh, Pamukkale, which means uh, uh, cotton clouds. <laughs> it's interesting. The uh, uh, the uh, mineral springs come out of the ground. They kind of they're warm, and they leave behind this white and pastel colored uh, uh, chalk deposits, and they form per, uh, terraces. Uh, so people go there for. Uh, uh, health reasons. They think the sulfur water will make them feel better. I, I suppose that's true. Uh, and it's uh, possible that John was thinking about these particular springs when he talks about nearby Laodicea as being lukewarm, ready to be spewed out. 
if you were to drink water from the spring at Pamukkale, uh, you would probably vomit the same way. And John may well have been thinking of that. The city of Colossae hasn't been excavated. I don't have a picture of that. Uh, the mound is impressive, uh, but permits have never been given for an excavation. Uh, it's uh, probably the right place, but we don't know very much about it. Uh, Ephesus, of course, is uh, very well known. Uh, the, uh, the cities of Ephesus and Sardis and Pergamum and Smyrna lying along the coast uh, were the pride of the whole Roman Empire. Uh, they were the largest cities in Asia Minor. Ephesus was the greatest of them. Uh, and uh, there are a lot more archaeological remains. The uh, port city of Ephesus allowed a flourishing trade with the Mediterranean world. Uh, we can see uh, just a huge amount of uh, uh, prosperity going on in Ephesus. Two major streets uh, th that we call the Street that uh, goes along the waterfront and the Agora and Theater Street, the Marble Road, which heads up the valley. Uh, it's a, a quite a hilly location, uh, but that allowed for, among other things, this magnificent theater. Uh, the, uh, uh, the theater probably would have seated 40,000 people. Uh, Acts 19 lists some of Paul's friends in Ephesus, uh, including uh, political figures and Asiarchs, important men of Asia. Uh, these were some of the most powerful people in Asia. Uh, and they were elected to be uh, by the citizens with the expectation that they would finance the games. Uh, these were Paul's friends uh, and uh, very interesting they are. Uh, there's a temple of Artemis uh, in uh, Ephesus one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, gigantic thing. Uh, it was uh, like something like uh, 125 by, uh, by 80 uh, meters. It was really, really, really large. Built in 560 BC, uh, an Ionic temple, uh, and um, was the first monumental structure built of marble in the Greek world. Partially burned, rebuilt in 356, destroyed by the Goths in 236 AD. And the emperor Justinian finally destroyed it entirely <laughs> to uh, help him build up the uh, Hagia Sophia church in Istanbul in the sixth century, which, which is probably not a very good thing to do. Uh, then there's some other temples that are also important, a very, very big and important city. Uh, it was, um, uh, the harbor silted up uh, and it was uh, uh, abandoned in the uh, uh, eighth century, uh, just abandoned, people walked away and uh, dust from the desert and wherever filled in the spaces. Uh, modern archaeologists have just had to sweep up the place to find a city that is essentially intact. Uh, this is the square out in front of the, uh, the library, one of the three great libraries of the ancient world. Uh, here is what's left of Sardis. Uh, the city of the Hermas Valley with a population of 120,000 people. Uh, it was destroyed by an earthquake, rebuilt by Tiberius, and has a temple. This structure here is a temple of Artemis. Uh, Pergamum, another of the seven cities, uh, set on a mountain. Uh, it's a, a 350 meters above sea level, 16 miles from the Aegean, but uh, uh, some major structures here from uh, about the second century AD. So we know that this was a very important city with a lot of connections. Uh, the largest temple in town was the temple of Zeus. Uh, and uh, it was huge, uh, really, really, really big. 
uh, about uh, about uh, 40 by 35 meters, a big marble altar that was dismantled and carried away to Berlin about 150 years ago. And it is still on display in Berlin to this day in a place called, strangely enough, the Pergamum Museum uh, on the uh, uh, Museum Island in, uh, in Berlin. Uh, some scholars believe that the, uh, the Temple of Zeus is the uh, place where Satan's throne is mentioned by uh, John in Revelation 2. Uh, Pergamum has another of the ancient world's great libraries, uh, along with Ephesus and Alexandria. Uh, on the western end of town, there was a thing called the Asclepion, which was a center for healing and the worship of the god of healing, uh, the uh, uh, ancient equivalent of a hospital. So Pergamum, major, major place. We go on to Smyrna, uh, which is modern Izmir. There's nothing there. We know that it was uh, it had a population of about 100,000 people in uh, biblical times. Uh, and uh, today it's a big modern Turkish city with very little to find. It happens to be the birthplace of the poet Homer. Uh, it had a major uh, Christian population uh, in the early years. Uh, then just a little bit, I'm just going to show two pictures from Patmos. Uh, when we come back on Monday, I want to show you a collection of, uh, of photos from Patmos, but we're going to quit now. Uh, the uh, photo on the right is the thing I call the goat path. Uh, and uh, here's a, a, a Greek hiker on his way from the port city of Patmos up toward the monastery. And the shot on the left uh, looks uh, down from the, uh, from the monastery that's built on top of the, the mountain, down toward the harbor of Patmos, where the ferry boats have all come in. Uh, <laughs> Patmos is certainly the place where John was exiled. And we see lots and lots and lots of details of John uh, on the island of Patmos and in Ephesus. So I'm going to stop the share there. Uh, and we're going to, OK, stop it. It's supposed to stop the share. There it goes. Bingo. And we're going to unmute everybody. Thank you all for joining me today. This is. <laughs> I, I enjoy showing off all of these uh, these pictures. There's so many of these places that I've been, uh, and uh, I love the connections. Uh, I love the way the uh, the Bible is directly connected to the geography and the history, the the background of the ancient world, and how everything connects to everything else. I, I like that. Uh, so I hope that this has been helpful. Uh, we will see you again on Monday, and then we'll get started <clears throat> looking at the, uh, the cities of Macedonia and uh, down as far as uh, Athens and probably Corinth. Uh, we'll, we'll do a lot of that and continue with Paul's work uh, uh, as he moved farther west. But till then, God bless everybody. Uh, thank you thank for you, uh, for joining Don. me. It's been fun. Yeah, Dr. John. Bye, Don. Bye, Joyce. See ya, Lorena. Bye, bye. Who's there? Lorena. Thank you, Dr. Bye, bye. John. Okay, PJ. Thank you, Anton. Lorena. Okay, bye, bye, everybody. Yeah. See you, Mark. All right. Bye, bye, Oscar. See you guys. Bye, bye, Doctor John. Bye. Ciao, ciao.